there is one possible reference to Mark in his Gospel. Levi, can you go to Mark chapter 14, 51 to 52? Mm. Now, uh, as Levi reads this, uh, take note of two things. Number one is that uh, uh, this little incident is reported only in Mark's Gospel. None of the other Gospels mention it. The question is, why does Mark mention this? And who is this guy? Number two, remember too that uh, Mark's mother, Mary, had a two-story building which was the first site of the first uh, the, the gathering of Christians, the first church gathering place in Jerusalem. A large house with a large upper room. Okay, can you read please, Levi? A young man, wearing nothing but linen garment, was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Okay, naked in the night. <laughs> now, uh, uh, this does makes no sense whatsoever, or whatsoever unless this young man is wow. Mark. And it's Mark's way of saying, I was there. He has connection with Jesus, and it's, it's a fairly um, remote connection. Now, everything fits the bill. Um, he would have been a young teenager. Um, and if it's so that the Last Supper was held in his house, he should have been in bed um, as it was being celebrated. Uh, you know, it could be that he then heard Jesus, the disciples, leaving. He didn't have time to dress, so what did he do? He put on, grabbed the sheet and followed them in the shadows. You've got to hope it wasn't winter. <sighs> yeah, well, who knows? Uh, poor guy. Naked in the night. Mark's Gospel. A linen garment, just like a sheet or something. Yeah, a linen um, cloth, sheet, garment. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, scholars tend to uh, uh, yes, <laughs> refer to things euphemistically. Okay, now, what's the purpose of Mark's Gospel? Uh, you, need, you need to attend and note two things which are quite odd and unusual. Tony, can you read the heading to Mark's Gospel? Uh, chapter 1, verse 1 of Mark. The beginning of the, start of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, literally, it is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. Or, uh, what I think it means, if I put it into modern English, this is the beginning of the gospel... Now, what's the gospel? The gospel is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So this is a gospel which tells us who Jesus is. Now, um, what is the beginning of the gospel? That, Christ, that Jesus is the Christ. No, what is the beginning of the gospel? That's the gospel. The gospel is Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, what is the beginning of the gospel? No, what's, it's this book. The whole book. The whole book is the beginning of the good news, the good announcement that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. What's the implication? This continues. I don't say this is only the beginning of the preaching of the gospel. And what's the gospel? The gospel has to do with who Jesus is. Now, take notice of that because this is important. Um, uh, it has to do with the identity of Jesus. Now go to the end of the gospel. Scholars point out that this is one of the strangest pieces of literature that's ever been written. Because uh, uh, it has a funny ending. Um, uh, chapter 16, um, the beginning first verses tell how 
Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome went to the tomb. They met the angels there. The angels told them that Jesus had risen, the tomb was empty. And then what's the last verse of the gospel? Uh, uh, Tony, please read verse 8. They are trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Full stop, end of the book. Finished. Now, it's one of the strangest endings of any book because it's as if you're telling a story and leaving out the last chapter or you're writing a play or a film in which the last act is missing. The last word of the angels is, go to Galilee and there you will see me. What question will anybody ask who reads this book or hears this book read to them? David? What happened? What happened next? Is it true that Jesus rose from the dead, according to the angels? Did the women tell anybody about this? Uh, did they tell the apostles that Jesus was going to meet with them in Galilee? Did they actually see Jesus? Now, um, uh, uh, then can you see the ending opens the door for somebody to do what? Say, if, if, if you are an unbeliever, you read this book, Garth. It stirs your curiosity. It stirs my curiosity and you'll come to me and say, What then? What then? Fill me in on the rest of the story. And what does that give me a chance to do then? Commit. To preach the gospel proper. Because the gospel proper has to do with Jesus' resurrection and the good news that through the risen Lord Jesus we have forgiveness of sins. Why is verse 9 through 20 being added? Right, they are later traditions and they show orally what kind, how people answered those questions. There's a number of alternatives there. They tell them the story of the appearances of Jesus. Right? So is that just copied and pasted from another? Or is that... They are later additions to Mark. They are part of the, the oral tradition, so they're part of the tradition, but they weren't there in the original manuscript so of Mark. What we've got here, because you said there was different versions, we've it's, just got, uh, decided to pick one? Or like no, it? this is the oldest one. This is the original ending of Mark. I mean, 19 to 20. Uh, there's, there's, uh, yeah, there's a number of different, uh, you can see two most reliable early manuscripts don't have 16, uh, 19 to 20, 9 to 20. Uh, this is the most reliable, but you also get variants of this, on this, which shows that there's a fluid uh, tradition here, textual tradition. So there was, so there's, we've just got the uh, 9 to 20 is just the answer to that question. Yes. So as people would say in their own different styles. The yes. The general one. What they'd get, what we know from are the other gospels, the stories. Um, so uh, we have an incomplete story uh, with no report of any appearance of the risen Lord. What this does then is prepares the reader for the oral proclamation of the apostolic testimony in the church. Now, taking that data. Let's ask the question, um, what, for what purpose was this gospel composed? Matthew's gospel was composed as a catechetical text, a teaching text, to catechize people who are already believers and to prepare them for baptism and enter into the church. Now Mark's gospel, however, is an evangelist handbook. Uh, what it does is confronts people with Jesus, the person of Jesus, uh, in such a way that they raise the question, who is this extraordinary man? Who is this man Jesus? Uh, Etc. So Mark's gospel was probably compiled as an evangelist handbook to proclaim that the crucified Jesus is the Christ, the King, the Son of God, and to show how his disciples share in his life and work, his suffering and glory. We'll come to that in due course. So it's an evangelist handbook, going back to Peter. Peter was a great evangelist, um, uh, presenting the gospel to people. 
It's interesting, if I can just do a little aside, one of the most extraordinary modern mission stories is the story of a missionary Fleur, a Lutheran missionary, who first of all uh, came from Germany, did some work with Aborigines in Australia, and then went up to New Guinea. And uh, uh, basically his work is the foundation of the very large Lutheran Church in New Guinea, which has more than a million members. Uh, now he, he used Australia as a base. Now, when he went to uh, what's now uh, uh, that area around Ley, uh, he preached the gospel, and it took quite a while, but then uh, there was a big breakthrough. People believed it. Uh, they were cotter speaking people, and they were baptised. They couldn't read, they couldn't write. They believed the preaching, and they volunteered to become evangelists. And Phil, missionary Phil, commissioned them to be evangelists. Uh, now, what did they have? They couldn't read and write, so Phil got them to memorise three things. Guess which part of the Bible he got them to memorise? Mark. Mark's Gospel. Number one. Number two, he got them to memorise the Catechism. And number three, he got them to memorise the hymns that were translated into Kota, their native language. So they sang the hymns, they knew the Catechism, they had Mark's Gospel. And they then evangelised not only their own tribe, but then they were the evangelists that basically uh, uh, evangelised the whole of the area where we now have a Lutheran church in New Guinea. A fantastic story that you must read up sometime. Um, it should be far better known than it is. What interests me is that he used Mark and gave Mark, then got them to memorise Mark and they used Mark to evangelise um, the people in New Guinea. Now what's the arrangement of the book? Uh, Luke is a, um, Mark is a mystery book and you need to attend very closely to this because this is the key to making sense of Mark. Um, number one, like the sermons in Acts, the Gospel of Mark is concerned with the identity of Jesus. Who is Jesus? Now what's the problem? If you had met Jesus 2,000 years ago, he would have seemed to you just like any other human being. There was nothing obviously divine about him. Huh? Uh, he was an extraordinary person. He said odd things. He, he did unusual things. But if you met him, you would have been puzzled by him because in many ways he was just an ordinary person and yet there was something puzzling about him. Um, and uh, uh, part of the puzzle was that when people asked who he was, he always fobbed them off in some way. He never came out with a direct answer about who he was. Um, now, Mark's Gospel follows the pattern of apostolic preaching to show that Jesus is the Christ. Now, what does Christ mean? Son. Anointed King, God's Son. Um, and the basic pattern is this. He was anointed as Messiah at his baptism. In his ministry, he uh, uh, fights his rival, Satan, rallies support and consolidates his claim to the throne of David. He's crowned by the soldiers at his trial and he's enthroned. And this is the offensive thing. He's enthroned where? Not in the palace in Jerusalem, not even in the temple. He's enthroned on the cross. Uh, so he is a crucified king. Uh, now, if there's ever a question about that calls into question his identity, it's that. That he's crucified, because anybody who's crucified basically is a criminal from a legal point of view, from Rome's point of view, and from a Jewish point of view, condemned by God. The two things together. Uh, so from human law and from God's law, he is a loser. Now, um, uh, it departs from the usual pattern by its emphasis on the rule of Christ from the cross to highlight the scandal of the cross. Now, whereas Luke and John emphasize the fact that Jesus is enthroned at the right hand of God, 
at his ascension, resurrection and ascension, even Matthew puts the emphasis on the resurrection. What does Mark do? Puts all the emphasis on the fact that Jesus reigns where? From the cross. On the cross. Jesus the crucified Messiah. Uh, now, the whole gospel is constructed around the gradual disclosure of the identity of Jesus. I like reading mystery stories, mystery novels, and I always have. When I was a uh, kid, read mystery stories, one after the other. Uh, hundreds of them. Love mystery stories. But all mystery stories are basically who done it. Now this is not a who done it, but it's a who is it. Who is this? So the mystery is not what was done, but the identity of Jesus. Have you got it? The hidden identity of Jesus. The mysterious identity of Jesus. Now, uh, the, G the identity of Jesus is disclosed gradually. First of all, he's acknowledged by God the Father as his one and only Son. At two points, two decisive points in Jesus' ministry, at his baptism and then at his transfiguration. At his baptism, Jesus speaks, I mean, God speaks to Jesus and says, You are my beloved son. And at his uh, 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 transfiguration, he says, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. To four dis no, three disciples. Three disciples. Uh, now, strangely speaking, and this is very important, very mysterious, who are the first beings to recognize who Jesus is? I would have expected it to be Peter and the apostles, but no, it's the demons. The demons know who Jesus is. They recognize Jesus. Uh, and they are the first to see clearly who Jesus is. Very important. Um, and something that you need to know in your own ministry is that where Jesus comes, where the gospel comes, there the demons are revealed. There Satan is revealed. The two things go together. The revelation of Jesus through his word and the revelation of Satan and the powers of darkness. The demons recognize Jesus. Uh, and that's right at the very beginning Satan recognizes Jesus immediately after his baptism and attacks him in the temptation. And then Jesus preaches his first sermon in Capernaum and immediately there's a demon-possessed man there who gets stuck into him. Um, and he says, I know who you are, uh, the Holy One of God. You are the Holy One of God and you've come to destroy us. So the recognition of the demons. Uh, who is the first human being to recognize Jesus? It's Peter. Uh, Peter, but Peter only does it partially. Uh, let's just read that story of Peter's recognition of Jesus. Um, chapter 11, I mean chapter 8. I want to read it a little bit backwards. Um, First of all, 27 through to uh, 38. Who's next? Josh, is it you? Um, sure. Sure, and then Levi, I, I mean, uh, then Garth, I want you to read 22 to 26. 20. No, first of all, chapter 8, uh, 27 to 37. Joshua? Yep. Uh, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Just stop there. That is the most important question that is ever going to be addressed to you and any human being because the answer to that question determines your salvation or your damnation. Now that is the question that you will need to pose as pastors, teachers in the church. Uh, who do you say Jesus is? Now what's... Peter, come on. Let's do it first. Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. 
and he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. To stop there, notice you are the Messiah, but he doesn't recognize yet that Jesus is the Son of God, the Father. He's the Messiah, and this, you need to see that in what follows. What kind of a Messiah does Peter think Jesus is? Keep going. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? That'll do. Oh, that'll do. Uh, why is it that Peter tells Jesus off, rebukes him? He was going to get crucified. Yeah, he's crucified. going to get crucified. And Peter well, said, that's impossible. You can't be that. You're wrong, Jesus. No, uh, now, but what is... Why does Peter rebuke Jesus at a deeper level? And Jesus recognises this. It says, if anyone would come after me, let him no, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. If Jesus is going to be crucified, this has implications for? Going to be crucified as well. Okay, can you see then? It changes discipleship. Uh, instead of you know, putting your star, hitching your chariot to a winner, you are hitching your chariot to a? Suicide case. Yeah, a, su a, a loser. And you're opening yourself to suffering and pain and are uh, hurt. Okay, now let's go read the story that's before this and um, note that P this is Peter's Gospel. This story is only told by Mark. So this story is unique to Mark. Garth, now can you work out now why is it that Peter and Mark put this story in front of the story of Peter's first confession of faith? Verse 22. 22 to 26, please. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. I don't, number one, he's, he opens his eyes, but he only sees partially. He can't see clearly. Now, what's the next stage? Once more, Jesus puts his hands on the man's eyes, and his eyes were open. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, don't go into the village. So that'll do. Now, why is it, Garth, that Peter and Mark tell this story before the story of Peter's confession of faith? Peter doesn't see the whole story first time. If Peter doesn't see the whole story first time, he sees, but he doesn't see clearly. When did Peter see clearly, and only when? Resurrection. At the resurrection. Yeah. Righto? So Peter comes to believe, if you like, or to see in two stages. He comes to recognize who Jesus is in two stages, and Peter is representative of all the Apostles, Because again and again, Mark emphasizes when Jesus teaches about his crucifixion, and he does that three times, the disciples don't understand, they can't make sense of it, they are blind to it. Their hearts are hardened. So uh, uh, Peter comes to recognize Jesus in two stages. But his is uh, a very important pivotal confession of faith. Well, who is the first human being to recognize Jesus as God's son? Let's go to, uh, uh, we'll go to the end first of all, chapter 15, verse 39. Please, Stephen. And 
when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Now notice that's the first human being to confess Jesus as Son of God. And which person was it? The person who saw Jesus die. die. So it's the death of Jesus that creates faith. It's also the biggest problem, because unless you look closely at how Jesus dies, his death is the biggest contradiction to the Christian gospel. He is the first one to recognize Jesus as the Son of God. Yes, Garth? Surely if you confess Son to be the Messiah, as Peter does, that's also confessing him to be the Son of God. Not necessarily. But all the prophecies that surrounds it, you kind of link up nicely to the fact that Son is the Messiah. That would also Only be. retrospectively. Okay, it's, it's much more complicated than that if you look at it from the other end rather than from our end. Um, right? He sees who Jesus is. He recognizes who Jesus is. He confesses to Jesus at the foot of the cross, seeing Christ. And that's the only place where we can see who Jesus is. His death shows us who he is. Now, uh, the... One of the strange features of Mark's Gospel is the fact that um, uh, whenever Jesus performs a miracle, he tells the person who has witnessed the miracle not to tell anybody about it. It's, um, it's as if Jesus, uh, instead of encouraging publicity about himself, puts an embargo on all publicity. But it's always connected with miracles. Why is it that Jesus uh, si uh, makes sure that people who have witnessed a miracle don't tell anybody about it? Yes? It, uh, he doesn't want that sort of hype to, for the people who follow him just for the, the good looks. That okay, good okay looks. because Jesus is not a miracle working so Messiah. A physical healer is supposed to be a spiritual healer and people who follow him only for the physical perspective. Yes, it's even more profound than that. And how does Jesus heal spiritually? And what creates the condition for faith? It's not by doing, but by suffering and dying. So it's through his death, through his death that he saves the world, not through miracles. What kind of a Messiah do people always want? A miracle-working Messiah who straighten out the mess. How does God save the world? By sacrificing his son. It's not doing but suffering, the suffering of God that saves the world. Um, and so Jesus' identity as Messiah is linked inextricably with his death. There's only one place in Mark's Gospel where Jesus actually confesses who he is. And you need to see this is a pivotal point in Mark's Gospel. Who's next? Uh, yes, David, can you go to Mark chapter 14, 61 to 62? A very dramatic moment in the trial of Jesus. Now remember the trial of Jesus is not so much about what Jesus did. Why was Jesus put on trial? Not because of what he did, but what he claimed to be. His identity was the issue. Okay, just read Mark 14, 61 to 62, the pivotal moment in the trial of Jesus. But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. I don't, um, it's at the trial of Jesus where Jesus is put under oath. He's asked directly by the high priest who is God's representative. Uh, are you who? The Christ, the Son of the Blessed One, Son of God. And Jesus says, I am. Does that ring a bell? Is it, uh, Yahweh, what? That's that Yahweh I am. He's saying, yes, I'm not only the Messiah, but I'm also Yahweh and uh, 
Uh, you won't see that now, but when will you see that? Will you see, um, um, but I'm also the, so I'm, I'm Messiah, son of God, I'm Yahweh, and I am the son of man. Remember Daniel, the son of man, is the one who, to whom God gives the judgment of the world and who shares the kingdom of God with the saints. So you will see what the Son of Man seated at the right hand of God the Father as co-regent with God and coming as judge on the clouds of glory. Yes? Sorry, I'm just a little bit confused. So just a bit, that's good. Is Jesus' answer here says, not just I am, but he says I am who I am. Is that what he's saying? That's those two things. Because it, 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 no, the son of the blessed one is a circumlocution son of God. So, so, the, so the Jewish high priest was expecting the Messiah to be a son of God. Uh, well, the question was there were two. There were two issues about the Messiah in Jewish tradition. One was that the Messiah would just be a human being, um, and therefore an adopted son of God, or that the Messiah would be a divine being and a true son of God. Right? So there's those two things. Is the Messiah, and you can see it in Jewish uh, tradition to the present day, is the, is the Messiah purely human or is the Messiah divine or what is it? And the basic emphasis in the Jewish tradition is that the Messiah is always just a human being. Um, so uh, uh, he is the son of the blessed, and Jesus, in, just in case uh, the high priest understands that this uh, he's the adopted son of the Messiah, he says, I am. He's not only son, but he's also divine son. Can you see that? And that's why that the high priest gets a little blasphemy. A blasphemy, okay. The, the, the trial's finished because he, a human being, claims to be God. Okay, he's obviously an imposter. It's theologically impossible. No human being can be divine. Therefore, there's no hesitation in condemning Jesus to death. Now, the irony is that Jesus was condemned for who he was. The high priest thought he was an imposter and put him to death for that, but he was put to death because he wasn't an imposter, if I can put it that way. Uh, uh, C.S. Lewis puts it quite brilliantly. Uh, he says either Jesus is um, uh, one of three things. He's either a madman or an, a liar or he is what he is. There's no other possible alternative. He's mad. He's a liar, an imposter, a deceiver, or he is the son of God. They're the only alternatives. And that's what it pins down to this. Which side of this does the high priest go? Liar. He's the liar. He's an imposter, a blasphemer. A blasphemer means that he um, desecrates God's holiness. Um, yes. If Jesus hadn't said I am, and he just had the rest. Because the, then he wouldn't have been claiming to be God. Well, it would have been equivocal. I know it could ambiguous, but Jesus does it in such a way that there's no equivocation. There's no. Uh, uh, danger. But notice the astonishing thing, and you need to see it quite clearly. All the way through, Jesus doesn't tell people who he is. He says he's the Son of Man. Okay, um, But it's a title. It's not his real identity. It, it has to do with his mission, his work. And then here, for the first time, he makes this full confession of faith. And this is the only time he says who he is at the trial. And notice then, it means his confession of faith is not connected with miracles. It's not even connected with teaching, but it's connected with his crucifixion. That's very, very important for Christology and the whole of Christian theology. He dobs himself in quite deliberately. And he wants, he wants to be crucified, if you like, for the right reason, not for the wrong reasons. Not for political reasons not for social reasons, um, but uh, not for psychological reasons, but for theological reasons, and the right theological reasons, which has to do with his identity as the Messiah. Yes? Um, uh, what would the Jews expect their Messiah to do today, and why, uh, 
why didn't Jesus open the scriptures to them then? I suppose that was because he wanted, like, he, he had to be crucified if he could open the scriptures to them. Here. Well, it's, the scriptures can only be open to them once after his death and resurrection. Because it is not his human life by itself uh, that brings in the kingdom of God. Now, all Jews agree that the Messiah is going to be a successor of David. He's going to sit on the throne of David. He will rule together with God here on earth, God the Father. So he will bring in God's kingdom, not just over Israel, but over the whole world, all the nations. Uh, that's agreed. Okay, but how does he do it? Does he do it with political means? Um, does he do it intellectual means, just teaching? Is he a spiritual guru performing miracles? No, none of those. He's the Messiah who reigns invisibly. Um, the crucified Messiah who reigns by through the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Dylan? Um. With the I am being that yes. Yahweh and thingy, how does that yeah. work with the being written in Greek? Ego I me. Ego I me, which is exactly what you find in uh, Exodus chapter 3 in the, in the Septuagint. Septuagint. Okay. And in Mark's Gospel, um, you mightn't have noticed then um, in the story last Sunday, when Jesus appears, uh, not, not, not in this one, but the next one that we'll have of Jesus walking on the water, he says, ego I me, don't be afraid. Uh, now usually it's translated, it is I, and that's not wrong, but it's stronger than that. Ego I me means, it's me, God, divine. That's why I'm uh, uh, walking on the water, that's why you don't have to be afraid, because I am the divine son of God. Well, that's, Peter confesses that at that stage as well, because you are... You are the Messiah. Yeah. No, no, but he doesn't confess Jesus as a divine Messiah. No, he calls out to his Lord, though. But, sorry? He calls out to his Lord. His Lord told me when he thinking. That's just Messiah. Uh, that is not, that is in Matthew's Gospel, not in Mark's Gospel. Well, you need to see that each Gospel tells, has a different purpose and so tells the story from a different point of view. Mark's point of view is, Mark's interest is the question, who is the Messiah? He's an evangelist. He wants to confront people with Jesus to get them to... Uh, uh, confess or deny Jesus. They're the two, two possibilities. Confronted with Jesus and his claims, uh, there's two possibilities. You can say yes or you can say no. And there's no other possibility. Uh, that's what Peter does. That's what Mark does. Now, um, just to summarize it diagrammatically, who is Jesus? Um, God the Father bears witness to Jesus at two points in the Gospel. And the third time that God the Father bore witness to Jesus was at his resurrection. So uh, three in all, but two are mentioned. After Jesus, who is the first to recognize, after the Father, who is the first to confess Jesus? It's the demons. And then comes Peter. And then finally, you get the centurion. And then, quite apart from all that, you get Jesus' confession of himself as the Messiah, the Son of God, as the I Am, uh, at his trial. Any further questions on that very, very important key to understanding the uh, Gospel of Mark? It's a mystery book, the identity of Jesus. Okay, you can see this in the structure of Mark's Gospel. Uh, it begins not with the birth of Jesus, but with the baptism of Jesus. Why does it begin with the baptism of Jesus? That tells you who he is. That tells you who he is. His Before then, there's, there's no clue to his identity. There's X, it's unknown. But the first indication of who Jesus is occurs at his baptism. So everything comes out of his baptism. Then this is followed by a section on the work of Jesus as God's Son. Uh, 
the uh, question of his authority and acceptance of authority. His disciples accept him, his authority. Uh, his opponents reject his authority. So the basic question always is the issue of faith. Do people believe or not believe, not in so much in what Jesus does, but what Jesus says? So everything hinges on the words of Jesus. Um, uh, and there's the division, the parting of ways. Uh, then there's the issue of acceptance of his teaching, which creates faith or unbelief, leading up to uh, the involvement of his disciples in his mission. That he calls his disciples to follow him uh, already before they recognize who he is, he gets them to join with him in his work, in his mission to the world. Uh, and then finally you have the climactic section which is punctuated by the three passion predictions. Note those, those three passion predictions and they kick in immediately after Peter confesses Jesus as the Messiah. You have three times Jesus says uh, the Son of Man needs to be handed over, suffer, die, rise again. The basic, notice that that's basically a summary of what we have in the Creed. Jesus suffered, he died, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he was dead, he was buried, he rose again. Um, and the focus here then is on the death of Jesus as his enthronement as king. Uh, he instructs his disciples about the need for his death, he pronounces judgment over Jerusalem, and then his passion is his uh, coronation and his enthronement as king. And it's the funniest coronation, the funniest enthronement that's ever happened in human history. It's everything is back to fun. Ironical. Uh, okay, any questions on that? Do you get your hang around it? Uh, the important thing is this gradual disclosure of identity, the mystery, what Scholars call, is, call this the messianic mystery or the messianic secret. Messianic mystery, messianic secret. Um, let's have a look at uh, the emphasis on the mystery of Jesus. Mark chapter 4, 11 to 12. And I think it's you, Dylan, isn't it? It may well be. Now, this is Jesus explaining... Um, the parable of the sower. You get the parable of the sower, the seeds, and notice verse 9, Jesus said, He who has ears, let him hear. Everything depends on hearing. You have access to the mystery of Jesus, not through his deeds, but through his words, his speaking. Dylan, can you read verse 10 through to verse 12? When he was alone... Uh, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Okay. Now, um, the word that's translated there as secret is mystery. Secret's not really very good, because as you know, a secret ceases to be a secret as soon as you know it. Uh, right? hmm? what? <laughs> the mystery. The mystery of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you. Now, okay, now, let's unpack that a bit. The other Gospels, the other synoptic Gospels, Matthew and Luke, use plural. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven are given to you. Now notice Luke quite deliberately says there's one mystery. Guess what that one mystery is? That Jesus is the Son of God. Right, oh, it's the identity of Jesus. What? It's who Jesus. It's the person of Jesus. And how is the mystery given to the disciples? It's not through the eyes, but it's through the ears. It's through his word, which creates faith, that gives them access to the mystery of who he is. Um, those outside look at Jesus, they try and work out what he does, but they don't listen to his word. 
and that word doesn't create faith in their hearts. They don't believe, therefore they don't have access to the mystery of who Jesus is. Mystery comes by hearing. Hence Jesus introduces this with this proverbial saying, let him who has ears to hear, hear. Everything depends on hearing. Now, this is expounded further then in verses 21 to 25. Could you read that further please, Dylan? 21 to 25 of the same chapter. This is immediately after Jesus' own explanation of the parable of the sower. He said to them, Do you bring in a lamp to do you bring in a do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever ha has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Now here Jesus is talking about his parables. The objection to him teaching in parables would be, look Jesus, you're deliberately hiding your message. And Jesus says, no, a parable is not meant to hide, but it's meant to reveal, disclose. A parable doesn't hide, it discloses what's hidden. And he uses the parable of a lamp. Um, if you think in terms of a Palestinian house, a one-roomed house, uh, once it got dark, the woman in the house would light a lamp, an olive oil lamp. She wouldn't hide it, put it in the corner of the house, or wouldn't put it under a bucket, but she'd put it where? Look it. Hang it from the ceiling in the middle of the room. The middle of the room so that it would light up the whole house. Now what's the function of parables? is to light up which house? The old spiritualness house. Which is that? Heart. The heart. The human heart. It lights up the spiritual house. The house of your heart. It brings, it brings light into a dark place because the parables bring Jesus into that place. And he's the light who reveals things. And then why does Jesus then go on to say, in connection with this parable of the lamp, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Consider carefully of what you hear. Why is it important? Why is hearing so important? Because you can give them mixed messages. Lamp. Think lamp. Oh, okay. Parables. You need to listen to the words of Jesus in order for the light of Jesus to be... I'll shine your heart so that you will see the mystery. It's by hearing that you see. Right? Okay. It's, you, you, you've got to learn to see with your ears. Uh, your access to the mystery of Jesus is not through sight, but through ears that hear what? What is it here? They need to hear not just everything, but the words of Jesus. Reveal the mystery of Jesus. And why then does he go on to say, to him who has will more be given? So anybody who has the word of, words of Jesus and has faith will receive more light, will receive more faith. But one who, anyone who thinks he has, no, who has not, will, even, will have uh, what he uh, thinks he has taken away from him. What's Jesus referring to? Sorry. Anybody who has the Word of God but doesn't have faith will lose the Word of God and will have no access to the mystery of Jesus. So uh, the fundamental focal point in Mark's Gospel is on not the mystery of the kingdom in the church, the world, not the mystery of discipleship, uh, not the mystery of the deeds of Jesus, the words of Jesus, but the mystery is the person of Jesus, who he is. David? Oh, I'm just, like, I understand that. I'm just confused where he says that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but not understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Okay, you puzzle that out for yourself. That's the whole purpose of the parable is to... Uh, and, and a proverb 
is not to give you an answer, but to the question. raise the question and to make you think and to look at it and to listen to it. Um, you need to go back to Isaiah and see what's there and you need to look at that and meditate it closely. I'm not going to do the work for you because then it will be of no use to you. Huh? Uh, that's my only explanation. Uh, let's see, uh, that's fast. Let's have a look at the next question. What kind of a Messiah is Jesus? Now, if there's one story that summarizes the whole of Mark's Gospel, it is this. Take note, nota bene, Mark 10, 42 to 45. Stephen, I think it's you. Notice the reference here to kings and their uh, courtiers. How do kings usually rule? They get their servants to obey them and to do their work. What's the most that a king can ask for any of his servants? Is that they lay down their life for the king. So they uh, do things, they get their servants to serve them. What's the greatest servant? service anybody can do for a ruler king is to die for the king. Okay, read please. Mark chapter 10, 42 to 45. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for men. But here you have a king with a difference. A king who serves his servants. And how does he serve his servants? Not by um, issuing commands, not by getting them to do what he wants them to do, not by using them to do his work, but he serves them by sacrificing himself for them by giving his life a ransom for the, a ransom there. So you have a king who becomes a servant. You have a host, a royal host, who becomes the waiter. You have the one who is the first one who takes the position of the last one. So everything is turned on its head. You get kingship here with a difference. Uh, and how does this king this royal king solve the problems of the world? He doesn't organize himself politically uh, and use politics and power, law and the sword to solve out the problems, to solve the problems of the world. He doesn't use organization to solve the problems of the world. How does he save the world? Doing what? Sacrificing. By sacrificing himself. Um, the Son of Man came not to serve but to be served and to give his right life a ransom for many. Now that many there means, uh, is Hebrew, means for everyone. So he's a ransom, <coughs> his life is for the ransom of everybody. That is an echo of Isaiah 53. Jesus basically saying, I am that suffering servant, prophesied in Isaiah 53. King with a difference. Um, We'll finalise the summary of the main themes of Mark next lesson, which is tomorrow, isn't it? And then I want to then begin work and do most of the work on Luke's Gospel. Question. Yes. Um, how are we going on our schedule? Are we keeping up with it? We're keeping up with it, yes. Okay, so I'll be